For practical purposes, there are big carp and small carp. The latter you may sometimes hope to catch without too great a strain on your capacities. The former, well, men have been known to catch them, and there are just a few anglers who have caught a good many. I myself have caught one, and I will make bold to repeat the tale of the adventure as it was told in the field of July the 1st, 1911. The narrative contains most of what I know concerning the capture of big carp. The most important thing in it is the value which it shows to reside in a modicum of good luck. So far as my experience goes, it is certain that good luck is the most vital part of the equipment of him who would seek to slay big carp. For some men I admit the usefulness of skill and pertinacity. For myself, I take my stand entirely on luck. To the novice, I would say, cultivate your luck, prop it up with omens and signs of good purport, watch for magpies on your path, form the habit of avoiding old women who squint, throw salt over your left shoulder, touch wood with the forefinger of your right hand whenever you are not doing anything else, be on friendly terms with a black cat, turn your money under the new moon, walk round ladders, don't start on a Friday, stir the materials for Christmas pudding and wish, perform all other such rites as you know or hear of. These things are important in carp fishing. And so, to my story. I had intended to begin this story in a much more subtle fashion, and only by slow degrees to divulge the purport of it, delaying the finale as long as possible until it should burst upon a bewildered world like the last crashing bars of the 1812 overture. Now that a considerable section of the daily press has taken cognizance of the event, it is no good my delaying the modest confession that I have caught a large carp. It is true. But it is a slight exaggeration to state that the said carp was decorated with a golden ring, nor was it the weightiest carp ever taken, nor was it the weightiest carp of the present season, nor was it the weightiest carp of June 24th, nor did I deserve it. But enough of negation. Let me to the story, which will explain the whole of it. To begin with, I very nearly did not go at all, because it rained furiously most of the morning. To continue when towards noon the face of the heavens showed signs of clearness, and my mind swiftly made itself up that I would go after all. I carefully disentangled the sturdy rod and the strong line, the triangle hooks, and the other matters that had been prepared the evening before, and started armed with roach tackle. The loss of half a day had told me that it was vain to think of big carp, you cannot, of course, fish for big carp in half a day. It takes a month. So subtle are these fishes that you have to proceed with the utmost precautions. In the first week, having made ready your tackle and plumbed the depth, you build yourself a wattled screen behind which you may take cover. By the second week, the fish should have grown accustomed to this, and you begin to throw in ground bait composed of bread, bran, biscuits, peas, beans, strawberries, rice, pearl barley, aniseed cake, worms, gentles, banana, and potato. This ground baiting must not be overdone. Half a pint on alternate evenings is as much as can safely be employed in this second week. With the third week, Less caution is necessary, because by now the carp will be less mindful of the adage concerning those who come bearing gifts. You may bear gifts daily, and the carp will, it is to be hoped in a manner of speaking, look these gifts in the mouth, as carp should. Now, with the fourth week comes the critical time. All is very soon to be put to the touch. On Monday you lean your rod it is ready put up, you remember, on the wattled fence, so that its top projects eighteen inches over the water. On Tuesday, you creep up and push it gently, so that the eighteen inches are become four feet. The carp, we hope, simply think that it is a piece of the screen growing well, 
and take no alarm. On Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, you employ the final and great ruse. This is to place your line. The depth has already been plumbed, of course, gently in the water, the bullet just touching the bottom so that the float cocks and the two feet of gut which lie on the bottom beyond it, terminating with a bait in which is no fraudful hook. This is so that the carp may imagine that it is just a whim of the lavish person behind the screen. Be sure they know you are there all the time to tie food to some fibrous yet innocuous substance. And at last, on Saturday, the 31st of the month, you fall to angling while the morning mists are still disputing with the shades of night. Now there is a hook within the honey paste, and woe betide any carp which loses its head. But no carp does lose its head until the shades of night are disputing with the mists of evening. Then, from your post of observation, fifty yards behind the screen, you hear a click, click, which tells you that your reel revolves. A carp has made off with the bait, drawn out the five yards of line coiled carefully on the ground, and may now be struck. So you hasten up and strike. There is a monstrous pull at the rod point. Something pursues a headlong course into the unknown depths, and after a few thrilling seconds there is a jar, a slackness of line, and you wind up sorrowfully. You are broken, and so home. I mention these things by way of explaining why I had never before caught a really big carp, and also why I do not deserve one now. As I have said, I took with me to Chesant Lower Reservoir roach tackle, a tin of small worms, and an intention to try for perch with just a faint hope of tench. The natural condition of the water is weed, the accumulated growth of long years. When I visited it, for the first time some eight years ago, I could see nothing but weed, and that was in midwinter. Now, however, the Highbury anglers who have rented the reservoir have done wonders towards making it fishable. A good part of the upper end is clear, and elsewhere there are pitches cut out which make excellent feeding grounds for fish and angling grounds for men. Prospecting. I soon came to the forked sticks, which have a satisfying significance to the ground baitless angler. Someone else has been there before, and the newcomer may perchance reap the benefit of another man's sowing. So I sat me down on an empty box thoughtfully provided, and began to angle. It is curious how great, in enclosed waters especially, is the affinity between small worms and small perch. For two hours I struggled to teach a shoal of small perch that hooks pull them distressfully out of the water. It was in vain. Walton must have based his Wicked of the World illustration on the ways of small perch. I had returned about twenty and was gloomily observing my float begin to bob again when a cheery voice, that of Mr. R. G. Woodruff, behind me, observed that I ought to catch something in that swim. I had certainly fulfilled the obligation, but it dawned on me that he was not speaking of small perch, and then that my rod was resting on the forked stick, and myself on the wooden box of the Honorary Secretary of the Anglers' Association. He almost used force to make me stay where I was, but who was I to occupy a place carefully baited for carp, and what were my insufficient rod and flimsy line that they should offer battle to ten pounders? Besides, there was tea waiting for me, and I had had enough of small perch. So I made way for the rightful owner of the pitch, but not before he had given me a good store of big lobworms and also earnest advice, at any rate, to try for carp with them, roach rod or no roach rod. He told me of a terrible battle of the evening before, when a monster took his worm in the dark, and also his cast and hook. Whether it travelled north or south, he could hardly tell in the gloom, but it travelled far and successfully. 
He hoped that after the rain there might be a chance of a fish that evening. Finally, I was so far persuaded that during tea I looked out a strong cast and a perch hook on a fairly stout gut and soaked them in the teapot till they were stained a light brown. Then, acquiring a loaf of bread by good fortune, I set out to fish. There were plenty of other forked sticks here and there which showed where other members had been fishing, and I finally decided on a pitch at the lower end, which I remembered from the winter as having been the scene of an encounter with a biggish pike that got off after a considerable fight. There, with a background of trees and bushes, some of whose branches made handling a fourteen-foot rod rather difficult, it is possible to sit quiet and fairly inconspicuous. And there, accordingly, I sat for three hours and a quarter, watching a float which only moved two or three times when a small perch pulled the tail of the lobworm, and occupying myself otherwise by making pellets of paste and throwing them out as ground bait. Though fine, it was a decidedly cold evening with a high wind, but this hardly affected the water, which is entirely surrounded by a high bank and a belt of trees. Nor was there much to occupy attention, except when a great fish would roll over in the weeds far out, obviously one of the big carp, but a hundred yards away. An occasional moorhen and a few rings made by small roach were the only other signs of life. The black tip of my float about eight yards away, in the dearth of other interests, began to have an almost hypnotizing influence. A little after half-past eight, this tip trembled and then disappeared, and so intent was I on looking at it that my first thought was a mild wonder as to why it did that. Then the coiled line began to go through the rings, and I realized that here was a bite. Rod in hand, I waited till the line drew taut and struck gently. Then things became confused. It was as though some submarine suddenly shot out into the lake. The water was about six feet deep, and the fish must have been near the bottom, but he made a most impressive wave as he dashed straight into the weeds about twenty yards away, and buried himself some ten yards deep in them. And so, home, I murmured to myself, or words of like significance, for I saw not the faintest chance of getting a big fish out with the roach rod and a fine line. After a little thought, I decided to try hand-lining, as one does for trout, and, getting hold of the line, with some difficulty because the trees prevented the rod-point going far back, I proceeded to feel for the fish with my hand. At first there was no response. The anchorage seemed immovable. Then I thrilled to a movement at the other end of the line, which gradually increased until the fish was on the run again, pushing the weeds aside as he went, but carrying a great streamer or two with him on the line. His run ended, as had the first, in another weed patch, and twice after that he seemed to have found safety in the same way. Yet each time hand-lining was efficacious, and eventually I got him out into the strip of clear water, where the fight was an easier affair, though by no means won. It took, I suppose, from fifteen to twenty minutes before I saw a big bronze side turn over, and was able to get about half the fish into my absurdly small net. Luckily, by this time he had no kick left in him, and I dragged him safely up the bank and fell upon him. What he weighed I had no idea, but I put him at about twelve pounds, with a humble hope that he might be more. At any rate, he had made a fight that would have been considered very fair in a twelve-pound salmon, the power of his runs being certainly no less, and the pace of them quite as great. On the tackle I was using, however, a salmon would have fought longer. The fish knocked on the head. I was satisfied, packed up my tackle, and went off to see what the other angler had done. So far he had not had a bite, but he meant to go on as long as he could see 
and hoped to meet me at the train. He did not do so for a very good reason. He was at about that moment engaged in a grim battle in the darkness with a fish that proved ultimately to be one ounce heavier than mine, which, weighed on the scales at the keeper's cottage, was sixteen pounds five ounces. As I owe him my fish, because it was by his advice I put on the strong cast, and the bait was one of his lobworms, he might fairly claim the brace, and he would deserve them, because he is a real carp fisher, and has taken great pains to bring about his success. For myself, well, luck attends the undeserving now and then, one of them has the grace to be thankful. So much for what I know about catching big carp. In fishing for them, however, I am somewhat better instructed. I can number a good many solemn days spent in the business, and I can recall just a few bites which invariably preceded calamity. Once, I remember, a stout new grills cast parted in the middle owing to the exertion of a great fish which seized a small potato. Probably there was a flaw in the gut, but I was not aware of it. Until I caught the carp of my story, I assumed that breakage was the natural sequel to hooking a fish of over ten pounds. I went in terror of those fish. Terror, however, adds a zest to angling, and carp fishing has always made a strong appeal to me. There is a placidity about it which you find in no other kind of angling. Having laid out your rods, you may just as well use two while you are about it, with a different bait on each. You are at liberty to smoke, meditate, read, and even, I think, to sleep, if all goes well. Nothing will happen to disturb you. You and the rods and the floats gradually grow into the landscape and become a part of it. It is like life in the Isle of the Lotus. But to enjoy it to the full, you must have something comfortable on which to sit. A box that has held ginger beer bottles is to be commended. It is of the right height, and though harder than a camp stool, is more spacious. In some places, however, you cannot be quite free from care if you use worm or paste. The worm, as I have shown, does not escape the attentions of ridiculous little perch. Paste attracts a shoal of absurd roachlets. It is a case of nibble, nibble, nibble all day with the paste, and of constant laborious swallowings of the worm. The only time when you are relieved from the trouble is when big carp are actually on the prowl. If, about sundown, all bites and nibblings cease and the floats remain unmoved, take heart of grace. Probably this means that there are two or three monstrous carp stealthily devouring your ground bait, and you may get a bite that is a bite. When big fish begin to move, little fish are awed into quiescence. The bait which gives you immunity from small perch and roach is potato, a small new potato boiled till it is fairly soft and stripped of half its brown skin so as to show white on the bottom. Bream are fond of potato at times, but I know no other fish which will dispute with carp for its possession. Where there are no bream, your small potato will lie undisturbed forever, unless a carp comes across it and takes it. Most men use a triangle in potato fishing, pulling it through the bait with a baiting needle until it is buried and hidden. A single hook ought to serve just as well so far as hooking the fish goes, but the potato is held better by the triangle if you have to cast it out any distance. French carp fishers seem to use beans more than any bait, the large dry white beans which you get at a grocer's they boil them with a flavoursome mixture of herbs, etc., wheat, fennel, hemp seed, thyme, and honey, until they are soft and plump, and use them both for ground bait and the hook. I have never tried beans myself, 
that I can imagine that they might answer very well, and that little fish would not worry them any more than they worry potato. An interesting account of the French method appeared in the field of August the 12th, 1911. For ground bait, a mixture of bread, bran and potato ought to be all that is required, and if you can keep a place baited up for some days before you fish, so much the better. Most of the stock hook baits are effective with carp at times, worms, wasp grubs, gentles and paste all being to the taste of the fish. Some anglers also recommend vegetable baits, such as green peas and macaroni. With smaller carp, fish from one and a half to about four pounds, I have found paste as good a bait as any, and I like to have it sweetened by the addition of a little honey. It is these smaller carp that give the angler most chance of sport, for they are not so hopelessly cunning as the big fellows, nor are they so uncertain in their feeding. There are plenty of ponds where you can make quite respectable catches of the smaller carp by taking a little trouble about it, and the fishing is by no means to be despised. Carp are very apt to drop a bait if anything arouses their suspicion after they have seized it, and therefore the advice given by all fishing writers that as little lead as may be should be used on the line is very sound. If the necessity to cast out a long way or to keep the bait still despite stream or wind makes a good deal of lead imperative, then it should be of such a nature that the line will run through it freely, either a bullet with a good big hole drilled through it or a paternoster lead with a fairly large ring. In either case, a small split shot will prevent the lead from slipping farther down the line than it should. I think it ought to be at least two feet from the hook, and it should just touch the bottom, so that these two feet lie along the ground. In some cases, where you have to cast a long way, it may be better to use a ledger, and in that case the bullet or lead should be on the real line, three feet of gut below it being enough. Some anglers get over the lead trouble ingeniously by squeezing a lump of stiff ground bait onto a couple of split shot and using that as the weight to carry out their line. It is not easy to throw, but once thrown, of course, it serves a double purpose. It has carried the line out and it attracts the fish. A carp sometimes bites very deliberately, and plenty of time should be given to him before one strikes. The rod is never held in the hand, and as a rule two or three yards of line are pulled off the reel and coiled on the ground, so that if a fish goes off with the bait he may feel no suspicious check. When the slack line is nearly drawn through the rings, the angler picks up the rod and strikes. Early morning and late evening are the times usually recommended to the carp fisher, but I am not at all sure that the best fishing is not in the early part of the night, from the coming of darkness till midnight. At dusk the fish began to roam in search of food, and in a lake they will cruise about among the weeds and reeds close inshore. Often, just at dusk, you can see the tip of the reeds swaying as if some softly moving fish, perhaps of a great size, makes its way through them, and when the light is gone you can hear rustlings and sucking noises, and an occasional great splash which are somewhat alarming. Night fishing, indeed, is full of alarms, for there are noises all about, on the bank as well as on the water. It is just as well to have a good conscience if you are going to do much night fishing. Seeing one's float becomes increasingly difficult as the light gets less, and after a time no ordinary float is visible at all, even though its head be black. For this emergency, keep a few black feathers and fasten one to the tip of each float by means of India rubber float caps four or five inches of black feather standing up from the water are visible so long as there is any light on it at all, showing as a dark patch against what is less dark. On some summer nights one could see a feather through all the dark hours by adjusting one's angle of vision 
according to the shadows on the water. If you get a bite and the float is under water for any time, the feather may get bedraggled and useless. If it were lightly touched with oil beforehand, it would stand immersion better. The question of gut is decidedly important in carp fishing. The carp themselves prefer fine gut, but where you are likely to get hold of a big one, I should advise you to disregard their preference. If you use fine drawn gut and hook a ten-pounder, you will be broken. If you use strong sea trout or grills gut, you may not get a bite, but if you do, ought not to be broken. Those are the alternatives. For night fishing it does not matter how strong, in reason, the gut is. In the daytime you can neutralize the visibility of strong gut by staining it in the teapot for a few minutes. It comes out a sort of dirty brown color, which is quite inconspicuous against the bottom of a lake or river. This is a good and valid reason for having at least two feet of gut lying on the said bottom. A bait hanging from an upright string must look suspicious to any fish of intelligence such as the carp possesses, but when the string lies on the ground there is nothing to distinguish it from a bit of weed or fibre, of which the water holds plenty. The only other method of carp fishing which is of any account is using a bait on the surface. I have caught a certain number of smaller carp by surface fishing, and I do not see why it should not account for big ones too. If you study the habits of carp which are accustomed to being fed, in such a place as the Regent's Park Lake, for instance, you will notice that they take very kindly to fragments of bread which float and escape the ducks and other waterfowl. A big piece of bread is very soon surrounded by a crowd of small fish, roach probably, which chase it about, nibble its edges, jostle each other, and generally have a good time. Of a sudden, however, a burly form forces its way through them, the little fish scatter, and then the bread is absorbed in quite a swirl. That is a carp telling you how he may be caught. In warm weather, carp swim near the surface, and it does not take long to call their attention to floating bread. The crowd of lesser fishes will soon do that. If you can once induce them to feed on bits of bread, and can then float a piece with a hook in it out to them, you can have an excellent chance of sport. The chief trouble is getting your bait out without having the hook stripped by small roach, and the other trouble is getting it out at all. The first difficulty may be met by using a piece of bread crust, which is tough enough to resist a good deal of worrying, but not so tough as to be unattractive. Toast might even do better. The next difficulty is met by using a very light reel line, greased so that it will float, and by having a breeze at your back which will carry the bread out into the lake. If the breeze is but slight, you can make a sailing vessel out of a dry leaf, hitch your cast in it, and it will carry your bait and line as far as you like, and if a fish should take the bait, the leaf will shake clear of the line when it moves. I have not yet had an opportunity of trying this manoeuvre over really big carp, because when other things have been favourable the wind has been lacking, and when the wind has been present other things have not been favourable. The fish must be near the surface to make the fishing worthwhile. A time, I hope, will come, and meanwhile I commend the idea to others for what it is worth.